good afternoon, everyone. Start with some opening comments. I have an echo over there. There it goes. Uh, the United States is deeply disappointed by Russia's veto of. <coughs> Still, maybe we can fix that. I'll start over. Can everybody hear me twice or just me? Yeah, I'll try. Well, lucky you. Double, 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 double the fun. I don't think that's true, Saeed. We'll, uh, we'll, yeah, we'll, um, we'll try it again, and hopefully we'll get worked out the gremlins. The United States is deeply disappointed by Russia's veto of the United Nations Security Council's 1718 Committee Panel of Experts Mandate Renewal. We are also disappointed that the People's Republic of China decided to abstain after 14 years of supporting this important mandate. <clears throat> for the past 15 years, the 1718 Committee Panel of Experts has been the gold standard for providing fact-based, independent analysis and recommendations on the implementation of UN sanctions on the DPRK. Throughout those 15 years, the Panel of Experts enjoyed the Security Council's, Council's unanimous support and, up until this year, has been renewed by consensus. Russia's actions today have cynically undermined international peace and security, <clears throat> all to advance the corrupt bargain that Moscow has struck with the DPRK. Moscow appears to be intent on facilitating the DPRK's illegal pursuit of weapons of mass destruction, and its veto today was a self-interested effort to bury the panel's reporting on its own collusion with the DPRK to secure weapons that it can use to further its aggression against Ukraine. Russia alone will own the outcome of this veto. A DPRK more emboldened to reckless behavior and destabilizing provocations, as well as reduced prospects for an enduring peace on the Korean Peninsula. Despite today's veto and abstention, all Security Council resolutions and UN measures addressing the DPRK's unlawful WMD and ballistic missile programs remain in effect. We will continue to work to counter the DPRK's unlawful actions work with like-minded states through all available means to limit the threat posed by the DPRK and respond to efforts by its enablers to shield the DPRK from responsibility. And with that, John? Uh, sure, let me follow up on that to begin with. Um, say Russia alone will own the outcome of the veto. Could you explain a little bit about what you mean by that? Obviously you're saying that, that Russia has a self-interest in this, but um, what, do you think there are any repercussions? Uh, is there anything that the US uh, or else elsewhere is going to do to, to enforce the sanctions a bit more after this? So the sanctions will continue to be in, in effect, as I, as I said, but uh, unfortunately this uh, important pan panel has not seen its mandate renewed, and um, we will continue to work to um, uh, secure information about the DPRK's pursuit of illegal uh, weapons, and we will continue to work to make that information public and make it available to other members of the Security Council. But I think what we've seen by, as a result of Russia's, or what we will see as a result of Russia's actions today is a DPRK that's emboldened. Uh, it continues to be largely isolated in the world, but we are in a different place than when you had Russia and China uh, voting to uh, uh, uphold accountability for the DPRK. And now you've seen a Russia that has cut this bargain with the DPRK because it's in desperate need of weapons to, to pursue its, um, its aggression against Ukraine. And then you saw today one of the ways that Russia is delivering on its end of the bargain with DPRK, which is trying to uh, undercut what had been up until now unanimous United, <laughs> United Nations Security Council actions. Uh, just to follow up on that, uh, I know that the U.S. has publicly spoken of cooperation between the DPRK and Russia. Um, is, it, is it your view that this will actually pave the way for greater cooperation? The reports that the Russian spy chief was in Pyongyang, uh, I think it was this week even. Um, is there concern that, that in light of this that there will be greater military cooperation? I, I don't think that what happened today paves the way for greater DPRK-Russia uh, cooperation. I think today, what happened today is an example of greater DPRK-Russia uh, cooperation. We saw the, that cooperation kick off last year uh, when they uh, began having, when there began to be increased talks but between the two. And then, of course, we've seen the DPRK transfer uh, military equipment to Russia that has shown up on the battlefield in Ukraine. It's been used uh, by Russia to further its war against Ukraine. And uh, we've been waiting to see how the Russia, see some of the ways that Russia would hold up its end of the bargain. I think we saw one of them today. Sure. Uh, maybe I could switch topics unless somebody else is the DPRK. Uh, I was wondering if you have a reaction to the, the ICJ, the International Court of Justice, uh, just today on, uh, on Israel. 
saying that um, uh, that that Israel must ensure urgent humanitarian assistance, so that the famine has 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 already set in in, in Gaza. So that order, to my understanding, was just issued in the last hour. Uh, our team is reviewing it right now, so I don't have a detailed reaction to. Um, to the, or, to the uh, full text of the order. It's something we want to review before we give that reaction. But a as a general proposition, of course, uh, increasing humanitarian assistance to Gaza is something that we support and something that we have urged Israel to help facilitate. So um, that general conclusion is very much something we agree with, but as it pertains to the exact text of the order, I want to give the team time here to look through it before I respond in detail. Just one more for me. I know you just said that you want time to review it, but is it the... Uh the word binding again, but the the uh, the International Court of Justice is it is it the view of the United States that Israel must comply with this that it must do more? Again, having not even reviewed the order myself and knowing that there is a team reviewing, I don't want to respond until we've had a chance to to do that. But I mean, just to follow up on that, can you say that in principle you are in principle? Of course, we support the the work of the ICJ, but I don't know if this. I, I just haven't reviewed the exact text to know. Um, uh, how it applies in this instance, so I'm, I'm obviously loath to comment on it for that reason. Um, I see, okay. We might come back to this, but um, just on, uh, do you have a reaction on the new uh, Palestinian cabinet that's, uh, that's been announced? Um, is it, um, what, do, what do you think about it? Because the U.S. has uh, called for reform of uh, the Palestinian Authority, um, looking at the list and the fact <clears throat> that uh, new prime a new cabinet has been announced. Is this something that the United States welcomes? So we have uh, long urged the Palestinian Authority to form a reform cabinet with new leadership. You've heard the Secretary speak uh, to this during his travels in the region. And so now that the PA has uh, appointed a new cabinet, we will be looking to this new government to deliver on policies uh, and implement credible and far-reaching reforms. It's something we've spoken to a number of times, our belief that a reformed PA is essential to delivering results for the Palestinian people and establishing the conditions for stability in both the West Bank and Gaza. So we will engage with this government uh, based on its actions. We'll be closely tracking the steps it takes to advance the uh, key reforms uh, and look forward to uh, engaging with them on that matter. Can you get into what the specific reforms you're hoping for actually look like? <clears throat> So in, in, I'm not going to get into specific reforms, but broadly speaking, we have encouraged them to implement reforms that crack down on corruption. We have encouraged them to implement reforms that increase transparency, that increase media freedoms, uh, and increase the ability for civil society to engage uh, with the government. And you said you're looking for them to, I think you said, like, act on policy. Like, which policies are you hoping that they Well, that's what, the, just the ones I just referred those to. Those <laughs> Yeah, those. Okay. But also, it, I think it's important. So. We've always believed that um, the PA needed to be a government that was fully representative of the Palestinian people in the West Bank and in Gaza. I do note that uh, there are, are Palestinians from Gaza who are uh, members of this new uh, uh, cabinet. We're, we have always made clear that we're not going to pass judgment on specific individuals. That's not for the United States to do that. Those are decisions for the Palestinian people. But um, we do welcome them taking steps to make a cabinet that is fully representative of the Palestinian people. And now we will look, look to them uh, to implement policies that follow up on reform uh, uh, and deliver on the, the, the demands that we have heard over and over from the Palestinian people. Said. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Matt. Uh, I hope you indulge me, you and my colleague. Uh, I want to go back to... I always indulge the, you, Said. I, I know you do. I, don't, I think, but uh, I don't know maybe, if that means... Maybe I don't know that means 14 questions are coming. That is true. Maybe, 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 not, I, that, maybe not maybe, that much indulgence. Yeah, but. maybe I have more this time <laughs> around. Anyway, uh, I want to go back to the issue of the uh, the Alpenage report yesterday. <clears throat> and you, you, you said that she... She made some anti-Semitic statements and so on in the past. Can you share those statements with us? Uh, I can't. I, I didn't actually think this was a, a controversial statement. Okay. You made a remark at, at right. one point referring to the Jewish lobby controlling America and, in right. fact, right. Uh -huh. expressed regret for that mark right. afterwards. Okay. So that's what I was referring but, to. But the, the, I think the term that was uh, she was accused for is when she used the term show off or Nakba, which is exactly in so, the, so the, Saeed, the word. I, I, hold on. Yeah, no, I will, I, I'm not referring to anyone else's comments. Right. Uh, and I, that's uh, not that, what that, I was referring that's to. What she, now I understand. But so. what the, the, the comment that she made, she, she said Shoah is Nakba in, in, uh, in Arabic, which is exactly what it is. Saeed, I mean, it's a catastrophe. Said, I'm, so, not, right. I'm not even familiar with the comment you're referring to, and that's okay. not what I was right, referring to fine. in my remarks. Right. OK, so let me, you also said that you disagree with the position itself, that you 
that you you're not you don't approve having that position in the United Nations. Why not? We have been very clear that the action that we uh, do not believe uh, genocide has taken place. We do not yeah. believe that's an appropriate term or a constructive one to use in this instance. So let me ask you something: Is there a reasonable definition of genocide that would include what happened in Bosnia or to the Rohingya? and at the same time exclude what is happening in so, Gaza? So, Saeed, the, the definition of genocide is one that is well right. okay. uh, found, hold on, hold on, right. well founded under in international uh, humanitarian law. Right. Uh, and if you look at the position that uh, the department's legal advisors laid out before the ICJ, right. ICJ, they do go through this chapter and verse. I'm not going to repeat it all of it here from the podium. Right. I obviously don't have the filing with right. me. But you can look where we go, do go through ex yeah. exactly why. Um, uh, we don't believe uh, a genocide is an appropriate term to, to use in this case. Okay, uh, so al although you know many countries in the world now, you know, are more and more using the term. In fact, France uh, said that they would probably try the soldiers that served in this war for war crimes if they are com committed if they are involved. But anyway, let me ask you about a uh, couple of other things, if you allow me. Um, the uh, Canadian Minister of, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, a Canadian minister said that the United States implored them to continue aiding UNRWA. Can you confirm that, that the, um, uh, the ambassador to the UN actually implored the Canadians mm -hmm. to continue aiding UNRWA? I am not going to get into private right. diplomatic conversations, but we have always made clear that we think the work that UNRWA uh, does is important, right. that we support the, the, hold on, the, yeah. I see you, I see you, I see uh, the, the, I'm I see the, you. I see I'm the, the, the uh, uh, see the interruption coming, so <laughs> sorry, just, sorry, just my habit. sorry. It's okay. that's fine, yeah. I, I understand. Yeah. Um, we have always made, <laughs> sorry, uh, we have always made clear that we support the work that UNRWA does. Um, and um, we have always made clear that it's important that that work not be interrupted, even though we were we thought it was appropriate on behalf of the United States to suspend our funding. Now, of course, that funding has been blocked going right. forward. So we have engaged with other countries uh, about different ways to ensure that the delivery of humanitarian assistance to the Palestinian people is not interrupted, uh, that it continues. Uh, and again, <clears throat> I think you have to go back to something I've said before that's been lost a little bit. When we suspended our funding, we only had an upcoming funding of about uh, an upcoming payment of about three hundred thousand dollars coming. Not a not a, a, not a, a major. When you look at the overall funding that we provide, it was not a major amount of money that we were providing any time before this summer. Yeah. Anyway, so we have been working with other countries to make sure that 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 work can continue unimpeded. So, by the way, I mean this suspension. Uh, now you know, that funding is blocked. Uh, does that make the investigation or waiting on the investigation? moot? Does it make the issue moot? So with respect to yeah. a question of U.S. funding, yeah. it's now blocked. That's a co right. an so act that of Congress and, you know, You're now you, waiting oh, on the hold results. On. Yeah. Hold on. Okay. It, it would, you know, the members of Congress, I'm sure, will want to see the results of that investigation, decide what they might do in future funding right. cycles. But certainly, we want to see the results of that investigation as well. And I should note that other countries have said they want to see it, and the UN itself, UN itself, which commissioned this investigation on its own accord, has made very clear that they think it's important that um, uh, they see that they get a timely, uh, a timely full accounting of what that investigation shows. And finally, I promise, uh, an Israeli officer. That wasn't too. That's not too. Uh, many, so that was no, no. anyway. Uh, an Israeli officer said that uh, Israel engaged in you know waste of uh, you know or overbombing and so on. He said we could have done the same thing you know with 10 percent of the kind of destruction that they levied on Gaza. Have you seen that report? I, and do I, you? I have. I've seen that comment. I'm not sure I follow. So uh, no, he's saying that uh, Israel engaged in obvious overkill in terms of uh, the amount of bombing, the waste, the destruction of urban areas and so on, they could have done exactly the same thing with 10 percent of the destruction. So have you seen that report? I, I, and, and maybe you ought to take a look at it. If you I, have not, I have not seen that specific comment, but obviously we have uh, urged the government of Israel to take every step uh, that it possibly can to minimize harm to civilians and minimize harm to civilian infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you. Alex, go ahead. Can I go back to uh, Russia, please? Sure. Thanks so much. Uh, Sorry from uh, Kirby's uh, statements this morning. Uh, he revealed very interesting details about communication between Washington and Moscow you know, in run-up to uh, last, last week's uh, you know, attack. He said that there, there was some written warning to Russians um, early last month. And he also said it was one of the multiple warnings since last September. Uh, I, I was hoping you could help us unpack it a little bit. How many terror attacks do you believe you have 
prevent it from in Russia from happening? How many people's lives you have saved? You think were they all about ISIS threats? <coughs> and finally, why do you think that they chose not to act on this very knowledge? I think you're going to be disappointed in my answer because, unfortunately, I'm not able to provide further information. Uh, as usual, when it comes to uh, information that we're able to declassify and make uh, public, there is a limit of what we can say uh, to protect sources and methods, and that's very much the case here. What I can say is uh, what the Admiral said this morning, which is we did on uh, uh, March 7th uh, provide a warning to Moscow. We provide uh, clear, detailed information about the terrorist threat to large gatherings, including concerts. We then the next day put out uh, a public warning urging citizens to avoid large large gatherings. And that was not the first warning that we've given to, to uh, Russia. Now, when it comes to um, uh, why they didn't take any action or, or, or why they didn't take sufficient action or whether they could have taken sufficient action, I just can't speak to that. So they chose not to take an action, and they no, start I, that, blaming. That, that's, that's not that, right. Right. That, that's not what I said. Yeah, the, the reality is that they didn't act. They didn't on prevent. That the, they didn't prevent. The, they, they didn't certainly didn't obviously didn't prevent the terrorist attack. But I can't. I can't speak to it. Right. Any, and they start blaming thing. Ukraine and the U.S. And then today they say that they have established facts that there was some funding <clears> involved from Ukraine. Do you do you, how do you square those circles? So what is, what is the intention there? And and uh, do you think? Uh, that, that this was deliberate, the, the, the deliberate approach from Russia from, from get go. A deliberate what from Russia? Approach like policy uh, to, you know, when they received that knowledge, they decided to build around it some new, uh, you know. Uh, so I, I don't think there's any circle that needs to be squared here. I think the Russian government is putting forward propaganda and disinformation. Uh, I think that's uh, been very clear that they are trying to use this uh, terrorist attack, this tragic incident. Uh, where we saw, unfortunately, uh, Russian citizens killed to justify their aggression in Ukraine. And the underlying facts don't actually matter. They're going to make up uh, supposed facts to back up what they want to do. That's what they've done, really, since the outset of this war. And sadly, that's what they're doing here. Thank you. Uh, Matt, on Ellen Gershkovich, you know, tomorrow is the first year's anniversary uh, of his arrest. Could we today confirm that we are trying to still, you know, uh, uh, discuss with Russia some options to get him out of uh, uh, Russian jail? Is there any active uh, offer from the U.S. since last December they rejected the one uh, that, that they haven't responded yet? I, I'm just not. I have never spoken in that level of detail about our work to to secure the release of either Evan Gershkovich or Paul Whelan, and I'm not going to do do so today. And my final one, if I may, on, on Armenia, we discussed his other person's reaction and, and he responded to that. Uh, but the Russians also seem to have you know been uneasy about this meeting. So Zakharova today, uh, you know, built up around uh, what Azir said yesterday. It was divisive. She said that the West is trying to, uh, quote unquote, create new rifts in the region, forcing the contest in the region to follow up uh, anti-Russian uh, line. So what is the response to the hard So I, I would say, to, if anything, the, um, uh, some of the turbulence we have seen in the region has been fueled by Russia's actions uh, over the past few months. Uh, with respect to this meeting in Brussels, as I said yesterday, it is to focus on uh, economic resilience for Armenia as it works to diversify its trade par partnerships and address humanitarian needs and nothing else. Uh, Matt, on Wednesday, 11 uh, women human rights activists in, were sentenced to 60 years of a total of 60 years of imprisonment in Iran. I was wondering if you have any comments on that. So we condemn the Iranian regime's use of harsh sentences for women's rights activists that are meant to intimidate them and suppress their voices. As Iran's leadership continues its violent crackdown on any dissent, they should know that the world is watching. Ongoing widespread reports of torture, forced confessions, and restrictions on legal counsel undermine any shred of credibility in the decisions handed down by Iranian courts. And the United States continues to coordinate with our <coughs> allies and partners to condemn these sh sham trials and to pursue accountability for Iran's human rights abuses. And we will continue to take action to support the people of Iran in practical ways, both seen and unseen, in coordination with our allies and partners. Thank you. Um, on Afghanistan, uh, the family of American citizen detained by the Taliban, Ryan Corbett, uh, released a statement this week saying that they have received a disturbing phone call from him um, in which the family says it was clear that his mental <coughs> and physical health is significantly deteriorating. CBS News interviewed the family in December last year where they highlighted the same concern about his health. Um, and I believe at the time, uh, uh, Envoy Tom West was, uh, he did have a meeting with the Taliban. I was wondering if you could update us on any talks between the US and the Taliban uh, with Tom West or, or otherwise. 
Uh, let me just first say, uh, with respect to the family, that um, as is always the case when you think about people who have their loved ones being uh, wrongfully detained overseas, I cannot imagine the pain that they're going through and the grief that they're suffering and how difficult it must be um, uh, knowing that uh, their loved one is going through such, um, uh, tra such, a, such uh, uh, a, a tragic hardship. And so what I can say to the family and what I can say to the American public on behalf of this government is that we are working every day to try and bring Ryan Corbett home. Uh, we have continually pressed, including in our meetings with Taliban representatives, for the immediate and unconditional release of Ryan Corbett and other Americans detained uh, in Afghanistan. We have made clear to the, uh, uh, to the Taliban that these detentions are a significant, uh, significant obstacle to positive engagement, and we will continue to do that. We are uh, uh, using uh, every lever we can to try to bring Ryan and these other wrongfully detained Americans home from Afghanistan. Uh, Matt, I don't know if you saw the report in the Politico uh, two hours ago about the day after, Gaza the day after, and the talks between the U.S. and regional partners, and according to the report, quoting U.S. official, that there is two ideas that gaining traction. One is to form a, a multinational task force, and the second one is to form a peacekeeping Palestinian force. Uh, but I, my question is if you can answer to this, uh, that is the Palestinian Authority included in these talks? So <clears throat> I'm not going to um, uh, speak to private diplomatic conversations or, or speak to what it sounds like uh, are, are reported, you know, anonymous comments from reported officials inside the United States government. Um, what I will say is that what the United States has made clear, and the Secretary first made this clear in a speech in Tokyo last November, is that uh, there are a few principles that we want to see apply to when the conflict ends. And one of those is that the Palestinian Authority should govern uh, both Gaza and the West Bank. We want to see a united West Bank uh, and Gaza that is governed by the Palestinian people through the, the Palestinian Authority. So we have engaged in talks with uh, partner countries in the region, and we have engaged in, in talks with the Palestinian Authority about uh, exactly what that might look like. And as you might imagine, there are a number of different proposals uh, on the table. I won't go into those here for um, uh, probably obvious reasons. But yes, we have engaged with both the Palestinian Authority and with um, uh, uh, countries in the region about the full panoply of post-conflict issues that Gaza will face. We, uh, um, you said before friend, on this podium that countries in the region are committed to Gaza the day after, but they want something from Israel to be committed, uh, for example, to the two-state solution all that. Israeli leadership still don't want to commit to this. Do, is there any update on your talk with the Israelis about that? Do, do you, are you being able to push them beyond their public, uh, public stance? So I don't have any update to offer. Obviously, they've spoken to this a, a number of occasions, but the work that we have been doing with our Arab partners is to put together not just a, um, a kind of nebulous idea, but a concrete proposal of what this would look like, of what um, post-conflict governance would look like, both as it pertains to security in Gaza and the rebuilding and reconstruction of Gaza and a, a political path forward for the Palestinian people that answers their very legitimate um, uh, aspirations. Uh, as part of that, we have had discussions with Saudi Arabia about how to further integrate Israel with its neighbors, including with Saudi Arabia, and those are uh, discussions that are ongoing as well. So um, that work continues, um, but at some point our, ver our goal is very much to have something to put forward, uh, to put on the table for Israel to, to look at. Um, and until we get to that point, uh, and it's something we're working hard on every day, I don't want to sort of speculate about what decisions might look like. Yeah, Matt, uh, what role will the uh, Palestinian Authority play uh, in the operation of the pier in uh, Gaza in two or three weeks? So I would defer to the Pentagon to, to that question. They are the lead in the construction of this pier. Um, uh, and I would, you know, for, for that sort of detail, I would, I would defer to them. But do you want the PA to play any role there? Again, I would defer to the, the Pentagon for, for that question. The PA is not currently uh, operating uh, uh, in Gaza. I know they've had uh, employees that were in Gaza, but of course the PA has not been the, the, 
the governing authority in, in Gaza for some time. Um, so when it comes to any kind of concrete role in that in the operation of the pier and the delivery of humanitarian assistance, I, I, like I said, I'd have to defer to the Pentagon. Yeah, follow up on this particular issue. Uh, it is said that the Israelis have agreed to actually provide security for uh, the operation of the pier. Are you aware of that? I've seen those reports. I don't have any uh, confirmation of them. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I asked you about, you know, repeated instances of Israeli soldiers rifling through and parading, you know, women's underwear, especially in light of al ongoing allegations of sexual abuse against Israeli soldiers and allegations that they tortured and sexually abused UNRWA staffers in order to co coerce false confessions. I'm, I'm wondering, you know, since then, we've, we've heard troubling details of these allegations, including soldiers sticking electrified rods up people's anuses. We've continued to see not single digit, but now piles of photos and videos of soldiers parading through women's underwear. So I'm wondering what are the updates on those instances we talked about a few weeks ago, and what is the update now that this keeps seemingly happening unabated? So I would say whenever we uh, see these reports, we make clear to the Israeli government what we make clear publicly, which is um, that they need to be investigated, and if appropriate, there needs to be accountability. And I would refer you to you um, to a comment that the IDF Advocate General, Major General, <coughs> Major General uh, Yifat Tomer uh, Yerushalmi, who I believe is the chief investigator for the IDF, said several weeks ago in a letter uh, when she wrote and said that uh, she had encountered actions by IDF soldiers that do not meet IDF values, that deviate from orders and disciplinary boundaries, and have crossed the criminal threshold, causing strategic damage to Israel in the international area. These acts and statements on part of individuals who do represent the collect uh, uh, these acts and statements on the part of individuals who do represent the collective have no place in the IDF. Uh, and you saw the chief of staff of the IDF, Herzi Halevi, say, uh, "We must be careful not to use force where it is not required, to distinguish between a terrorist and who is not, not to take anything that is not ours, a souvenir or weapons, and not to film revenge videos." So. The IDF has made very clear itself, this is in the United States speaking, that they do see, they have seen inappropriate actions take place by IDF soldiers and they need to be investigated uh, and, and those responsible need to be held accountable and we would very much agree with that. And then on the sexual abuse allegations, any sort of update on? I don't, I don't have any update on those, okay. on those, what I understand are ongoing investigations. And then just on the assurances, you know, earlier you said after receiving assurances from Israel that they're not violating humanitarian law, the U.S. so far has not seen proof of that. Wondering what these assurances look like, because you know we have all seen proof from the International Court of Justice, from the United Nations, and from footage, especially the past few weeks, over and over again, of Israel seemingly targeting civilians, hospitals, churches, footage even yesterday showing Israeli forces seeming to execute unarmed Palestinians waving white flags. They're blocking aid to the point that the U.S. is trying to build a pier to deliver aid as if Israel is a belligerent and not an ally. So with all this, how is Israel not violating humanitarian law? Are these assurances just Israel saying that they promised they're not, so, and they evidently continue to do so. So I spoke, so I spoke to this uh, extensively on Monday and Tuesday, and I would encourage you to, to check the transcript. I'll do a little bit of it again, but I don't think I think I will spare everyone else here 15 or 20 minutes of me uh, in vain on the national security memo again. But what I will say is, um, uh, we received assurances from the government of Israel that are consistent with the requirements of the national security memo. Now. Uh, but I think to your underlying question, we look at those assurances um, through a lens of the ongoing processes that we have to answer this very question. And we do have question, we do have processes going on examining um, specific incidents in the um, uh, in the conduct of the campaign, and uh, those processes are ongoing. They've not reached a, a, a final uh, determination at this point. Thank you, Matt. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering if you have any reaction and comments about. Uh, Hamas leader visit to Iran and what he said about the Israel. He said that the Israel is losing the international community support and he took the UN security resolution as an evidence that the Israel is losing support. Do you have any reaction and comment on that? So I'm not going to respond broadly to something that um, uh, a leader of, of Hamas said, but I would say with respect to the UN Security Council resolution, we've made very clear uh, our position on that resolution, which is we think it is consistent with our longstanding position, not think, it is consistent with our longstanding position that there ought to be a ceasefire linked to the release of hostages, and that's what we have um, uh, believed Israel's position to be as well. And do you have any sense that Israel is losing the international community support because they are not 
following the UN uh, Security Council resolution? Uh, look, I think if you look around the world, there are a number of countries who have not supported Israel's action from the beginning. I think that's been uh, uh, pretty clear and not at all in dispute. Uh, and then there have been countries like the United States that have backed Israel's right to defend itself while at times disagreeing with certain ways they went about this campaign. Uh, uh, and calling on them to do more to both protect civilians and deliver uh, in, in, increase the delivery of humanitarian assistance to those civilians. Thank you, sir. According to uh, some media reports, uh, India had submitted the findings of the attempted murder of a uh, Sikh human rights lawyer, Gurbhavan Singh Panu, in New York. Could you share some details, please? Uh, I'll have to get back to you. I'm not a, I'm not a, I have not seen those reports. So after the attack in Moscow, officials uh, are warning that the group has also set its sights on Western targets. How would you respond to the threat posed by ISIS? That has set its sights on on what? So how, how you? Uh, no, I missed the I missed the middle part there of the the build sir, uh, question. The intelligence reports and officials are warning that the group has also said to set its sights on Western targets. How would you respond on to the Western threat targets. Oh, I see. Oh, sorry. I apologize. So we remain vigilant against the evolving threat uh, posed by terrorist groups, including ISIS-K. Uh, we have maintained an unwavering focus on terrorism since the president took office three years ago, working both unilaterally and with our partners to successfully disrupt threats around the globe and degrade ISIS. Uh, in addition, in February uh, 2022, operating on the president's orders, U.S. military forces successfully targeted Haji Abdullah, the leader of ISIS, later that year, uh, at the president's direction, the United States successfully included an airstrike in Kabul, Afghanistan, that killed the emir of a different terrorist group, Al Qaeda, uh, Ayman <coughs> Al -Zawah Zawahiri, uh, and we will continue to work to uh, hold ISIS accountable for its actions and to pre uh, uh, prevent uh, terrorist attacks against uh, the United States and other Western countries. So the main hideouts of these terrorist uh, groups are based in Afghanistan, and the United States always said that it will continue to have the ability to target terrorists in Afghanistan who pose a threat to American interest. interest. So is there any action expected? On so we, re we remain committed to ensuring that Afghanistan can never again be a launching pad for terrorism, and we continue to push the Taliban to fulfill all of their counterterrorism commitments to the international community. We have made clear to the Taliban that it is their responsibility to ensure that they give no safe, safe haven to terrorists, whether it be al-Qaeda or ISIS-K or any other terrorist organization. And we remain vigilant against the evolving threat of these terrorist groups. And our global coalition to defeat ISIS and the C5 plus 1 help intensify our efforts to monitor terrorist threats from the region and prevent terrorists' ability to raise funds, travel, and spread propaganda. Sean, go ahead. Sure. Uh, you issued a statement, um, I believe, last night on this, on the, the opposition struggles to, to field a candidate against uh, Maduro. Uh, are you under the impression that this violates the understandings in Barbados, the Norwegian brokered understandings, and, um, and, and what does this mean about a potential snapback of sanctions? So I, I would say that we remain deeply concerned, and it's not just the United States that's deeply concerned, it's our regional uh, partners who share this concern about decisions by the Venezuelan National Electoral Council uh, to prevent opposition parties from registering candidates for the upcoming presidential election. Uh, we are going to continue to make clear to Maduro and his represent, uh, representatives that there needs to be, uh, they need to ensure international observer access, they need to end the jailing and harassment of civil society members, uh, and they need to allow a free and fair election. And then, as we have made clear, Actions that run counter to the letter and the spirit of the Barbados Agreement will have consequences. We've spoken to that. We've spoken to the fact that there's a general license that expires uh, next month. I'm not going to make any um, determinations from here about how um, uh, about what decision we will take then. But we have been very clear with the the with Maduro and his representatives about what we expect them to take and what the consequences could be if they don't. Just a brief follow up. Um, not to put words in your mouth, but you're saying that there's no determination. Yeah, there's no determination from here as of now what decision I'll take. Is there still time, basically? I mean, could they still, um, is there still time? So the only thing I'll say is we've made clear that the, that general license with respect to oil uh, expires in April. And you heard us say some months ago that that's an important date to watch. We allowed another general license uh, to expire and not be renewed. I think it was one for gold, and there's a big one coming up for oil. And uh, that continues to be an important date. And we're going to be watching the uh, Maduro's actions and making determinations about how we will proceed. Uh, just a couple more. Um, 
don't know if there's something you're following, but tensions between Colombia and Argentina. Um, <laughs> I have been following that. Okay, yeah. okay, great. There makes two of us. Uh, the um, it's not the same as saying I'm going to have anything to say about it. Right, I haven't I, I been following it. Right, I wasn't. I wasn't counting. <laughs> But, uh, but, <laughs> but but what do you make of it? I mean, the um, uh, vendors and the, the chronology, uh, the president of Argentina, uh, President Malay, said that President Petro is quite a terrorist, and Colombia has, uh, has expelled diplomats. Uh, do, does you, has the U.S. been as friendly relations with both countries? Has the U.S. been a good deal at all? With so I think I'm going to stay out of this one. This is ultimately uh, an issue between Colombia and Argentina. I will say that we, uh, as you noted, maintain strong relations with both of them, and we support continued dialogue and diplomatic relations between both sides. But as to this specific dispute, I think I will refrain from And you're going to stay out of the, the actual remarks? Uh, yes, exactly. I, I, I think that would be wise. Uh, <laughs> just, one, just more before I yield. Do you have anything more to say about Niger after yesterday? Anything more? On the... No, it's something that we continue to work on, and we continue to engage with the, uh, the CNSP, but I don't have an update. Um, thanks, Matt. Can you give us uh, any uh, indication or awareness of the um, of Haiti's trans um, transitional presidential council being closer to formation? I believe eight members have been chosen of what's supposed to be a nine-member um, council. And uh, any update on U.S. plans for further evacuations of Americans from Haiti? So uh, on the first, you may have seen that they issued a statement yesterday. We were encouraged to see the transitional presidential council release uh, its first statement. We hope that the council will continue to work to take the steps they outlined in that statement, including finalizing their organization and operation, appointing an interim prime minister, and taking steps to restore order to Haiti. Uh, ultimately, as we've said, these are decisions for Haitians to make. We will continue to work with CARICOM and our partners in the region to offer our support for them uh, as they go through this process. And then with respect to uh, facilitating the departure of American citizens, let me first give you an update on the numbers. We now have um, uh, successfully evacuated or facilitated the departure of somewhere around 450 U.S. citizens since March 17th. Uh, that includes uh, over 300 that have departed Port-au-Prince and almost 100 from Cap Haitian. There are helicopters uh, that are going today uh, from Port-au-Prince to Santo Domingo, and we continue to explore other alternatives and other options to um, get American citizens out of Haiti, but I don't have any announcements today. Uh, but we're going to continue to work on that and may have more to say tomorrow or over the weekend. Um, my first question is about uh, Congress had asked uh, the Assistant Secretary Donald Liu to send the Pakistani ambas uh, U.S. Ambassador in Pakistan, Mr. Bloom, to meet Imran Khan. Any update when he's meeting? Congress asked who in Congress? Uh, you know the congressional hearing where Mr. Donald Liu had appeared? I, I remember that, yeah. I just, uh, usually Congress means like an act of Congress. I don't, do you oh, mean like a member of Congress? or? Yes, yes. A couple uh, of members of Congress had asked uh, the Assistant Secretary that uh, the U.S. ambassador should go and meet Imran Khan in jail to see how he is, what's the situation. I don't have any updates on um, uh, meetings by the ambassador. Okay, just one more thing. Um, 6,000 scholarships each year the U.S. gives to Pakistani students, and not a single complaint has ever been seen. All students are taken on merit. It's amazing. But since the uh, lady who you have called Milestone, because I carry these values from the high school and university here uh, from the U.S. So that's why I do get upset at times when you use uh, terms like milestone for corrupt people. This uh, principal sorry, in sorry Pakistan. Sorry you. Yes, it does. Ups. Michael uh, Thompson, a principal at a university, uh, a college in Lahore, where the milestone lady uh, that you call is the chief minister there, he just resigned there because one of her uh, favorite uh, uh, tried to waive off his son's tuition fee. The principal, an Australian principal working in Lahore. Isn't this shameful? Like, I, and should you I, be calling milestone to people? I, like I could not possibly have a comment on that situation. Go ahead, in the back. Yeah. 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 Come to you next, yeah. Yeah. in the back. Okay. Uh, the United uh, behind you, sorry, I'll come to you. I'll come okay. To back uh, of the room, you're happy. Okay, the, the United States approval of limited operation in Rafah acts as a green light for Israel to start a military operation in Rafah. This is seen as a step back in the U.S. stand, which affecting its image and credibility. Uh, what's your comment, please? I think that's a bit of a mischaracterization of what we said with respect to Rafah. Uh, first of all, we have always made clear that we support Israel's right to uh, hold Hamas accountable and its right to uh, uh, take the fight to Hamas operatives uh, inside Gaza, including in Rafah. 
what we have said is that we think that there is a better way to do that than the full-scale operation that uh, Israel has said it's comp contemplating, and we look forward to having a conversation in the coming days with Israel to lay out what those options could look like and what that better path could look like. We have always made clear, though, that um, whatever kind of military operation that Israel conducts, whether it be in Rafah, whether it be in Khan Yunus, or whether it be anywhere else, needs to take into account the civilian population and minimize civilian harm uh, to the to the, the population uh, in those communities. Excuse me. Uh, there is a guarantee that uh, 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 civilian will not affected or not. Uh, 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 dangerous their life look I think it's hard I mean it's, it's obviously in any war impossible to make a guarantee what we want to see is civilian harm yes. minimized to the maximum extent possible and so that means uh, uh, putting uh, uh, designing military campaigns around protecting civilians first it's one, one thing the secretary has made clear in his conversations with the government of Israel that they ought to do uh, and at the same time it's a separate issue but it's very much connected making sure that they do everything to facilitate the delivery of humanitarian assistance so that those civilians uh, who do remain uh, uh, in Rafah or anywhere else inside Gaza uh, have access to food and water and medicine and shelter that they need uh, to survive in what is obviously a very difficult situation in the middle of an, uh, an open war. Okay, excuse me. I want to ask you about the mission of the American military delegation to Tel Aviv, uh, whether as an uh, alternative of visit of the Israeli military uh, uh, delegation to Washington DC and what the idea they carry uh, any the uh, and there is uh, headlines of for this delegation so with respect to a military delegation I think my colleagues at the Pentagon are briefing in an hour a little over an hour and I would encourage you to submit that question to them they should speak to that okay thank you for the Italian division oops so um, that's my question um, um, United States, NATO uh, under President Biden got uh, more strong and Europe is happy about it. But um, there are talks in Europe, um, the gover different government would like to create um, Euro an European force that can support NATO and the US. So what would it be um, the answer uh, from the US, from the State Department, if Europe would create a European, their own European forces to protect Europe. So I don't want to speculate. We will continue to um, uh, work with our European partners. Uh, but as you made clear in, in, I think, the lead into your question, we have been very clear about the United States' commitment to NATO, the United States' commitment to our transatlantic alliance, the United States' commitment to all of our allies uh, in Europe. And we think it's important that NATO be bolstered and expanded, as we have seen uh, uh, happen with the increase uh, or with the increase in two members in the last uh, year or so. Yeah, can I ask you? Can I ask yeah, you? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So they're, they're not against uh, NATO. That actually, they would, this uh, force would make it yeah. NATO stronger. But the, the other question would be, um, uh, do the, does the U.S. believe that Europe should be more active to protect themselves, let's say, um, also helping more Ukraine or be more active in the Mediterranean with the Middle East, or should be done always together with the U.S.? So I think that's a, a, a incredibly broad question that's hard to answer in make the it, time I, I, but what can you I, say I, I, I have shortly. here. Um, I would say that we want to work together with our European allies, but that doesn't mean that they can't do things outside of uh, cooperation with the United States. But we share values and interests with those uh, countries, and we work together. And sometimes they do things separately but that, that, that pursue our, our common goals. Uh, and we, of course, support that. Thank you. Uh, so it's uh, about a dozen CEOs from American businessmen met with uh, Xi Jinping yesterday. Um, so the CCP has uh, been, you know, notorious for linking silence with uh, human rights abuses uh, on, a, on a trade relationship. Um, how does the United States ensure that human rights is the foundation of these trade relationships with uh, China? So I will say that uh, in all of our meetings with officials from the PRC, we make clear uh, where we have concerns about China's human rights practices. We raise them consistently. Um, that includes uh, uh, the secretary when he has met with his counterparts, uh, and that includes other officials from the U.S. government make very clear uh, what we think about human rights in, in, in China and where we have uh, deep concerns. And uh, also the uh, CCP is banning Intel and AMD uh, sales, their, their chips. Um, how does the U.S. protect uh, American companies in this regard doing business with China? Uh, let me take that one back and get you an answer. Sure. Go ahead. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Come on back. 
to the Moscow attack, the New York Times reported today that the United States it did not provide Moscow with all the information it had about the threat of the attack because it didn't want to disclose its sources and methods. Do you believe the warning Washington provided to Moscow contained all the all the details about the attack? So I'm not going to speak to intelligence information from here. I think that's I've always made that pretty clear. But what I'll say is that we provided clear, detailed information to Russian authorities about terrorist threat terrorist threats against large gatherings and concerts. Notable word uh, in Moscow, and unfortunately, I have to leave it at that. One more question: uh, There are media reports in Russia and Ukraine that uh, Victoria Nuland had to resign because of uh, an imminent investigation about her activity in Ukraine since 2014. <laughs> Do you have anything on that? that is, yeah, that is absolutely false. And uh, I know Toria has long been a boogeyman for the Russian government. It's not the first time they've uh, propagated disinformation against her. I guess I might have thought it would stop with her departure from the State Department, but maybe I'm surprised that it hasn't. No, that is absolutely false. And I think with that, we'll wrap for today. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.